the Manchester Guardian, for whom he started writing editorials, and who, more than anyone else, taught him the virtues of writing to be read. Well, Manchester was a great city. Uh, it still was the city that it had been in the 19th century, just. It was still possible to say what Manchester thinks today, England thinks tomorrow. On the other hand, it was beginning to be on the slide. Um, it was beginning to lose its self-confidence. Um, and it was beginning to be true here in the university that the, the clever young men were drifting away. This had been a great history department and was still a great history department in the 1930s. But over and over again, young historians would come here, learn their craft, and then they would go down the Oxford Road to the more ancient city of Oxford to reach fulfillment of their careers. And Taylor was no exception. For all his bluff northernness, he was desperate to get back to Oxford. After three attempts, he finally got a job at Magdalen College. He was to stay here for the next 38 years, living on the edge of college, teaching in a pair of drafty 18th century rooms underneath a stuffed owl. He was a legendary lecturer. The lectures that he gave in Oxford on a Wednesday morning at nine o'clock were remarkable. I once asked him why he didn't do them later. And he said, if I spoke at 11, there was no hall big enough in Oxford to hold my audience which was a typical little bit of uh, AJP's conceit. He was probably right, too. He spoke just as he was to speak in those television uh, programs, absolutely without notes, totally clearly, coherently, excitingly, and always ending absolutely on time to the second. Right on the hour, he stopped and walked out, to gasps of astonishment that someone could quite do this. But his reputation rested on more than his star performances in the lecture hall. By the end of the war, Taylor was already the author of four major studies of European war and peace between the ages of Napoleon and Lloyd George. He'd become a historian to be reckoned with, a brilliant writer with broad areas of expertise. Taylor, I think, deserves to be remembered as probably the greatest British historian in the century. Uh, he was someone who could write not merely on British history, but on European history. Uh, he would write on military history, diplomatic history, really all facets of history. I'm a straight narrative historian. I like telling stories. History to me is, I don't say just a record of events, but it deals with the child's question, what happened next? And all my books are an attempt to answer the question, what happened next? Though sometimes the other question, why did it happen? He claimed he was just a storyteller. But what made his books fizz was their willingness to cut through hesitation and pronounce judgment. Readers loved it, even if it made other historians wince. I would place Taylor's reputation very high because he was the first person who questioned received ideas about the 20th century, uh, not in a superficial way, as, as many essayists and people write articles did, but with terrific intellectual voltage, which actually inspired people when they were um, reading it to ask their own questions. In 1961, Taylor published his most controversial book, The Origins of the Second World War. It caused a storm of outrage because Taylor implied that Hitler had not had any master plan for starting a major European war. Taylor proposed a new and uncomfortable picture of Hitler, not the man evilly determined to have conflict at any cost, but Hitler the opportunist, the reckless gambler who stumbled into war only at the last minute because the indecision and the weakness of the Western appeasers made it worth his while. The book combined classic Taylor ingredients, a refusal to accept even the most sacrosanct historical explanations and inflammatory conclusions about an event still fresh in the minds of his readers. It was a bestseller. Other historians rounded on him in a fury, most famously Hugh Trevor Roper in this televised debate. Most of us have always believed that Hitler planned the Second World War as part of a general scheme of world conquest. A whole school of professional historians substantiates this view, and a vast amount of literature has been written about these aggressive aims of Hitler and his whole philosophy of world domination and his policy. This view has now been challenged in a most provocative way in a recently published book, The Origins of the Second World War. The author of this book, Mr. A.J.P. Taylor, has said, for instance, 
The war of 1939, far from being premeditated, was a mistake, the result on both sides of diplomatic blunders. Can we now move on to the second half of this Czechoslovak crisis, the occupation of Prague by Hitler in March 1939? Trevor Roper, would you accept Taylor's interpretation of that? Certainly not. Will you explain why? Mm. Taylor maintains that the occupation of Prague by Hitler, uh, if I've interpreted it correctly, was an unfortunate development which Hitler himself hadn't thought of before, which was forced upon him by events in Slovakia but he would have much preferred to have stopped at Munich. That is the implication of Taylor's book. W what is no, that? my implication is that, as usual, Hitler didn't think about any of these things. But Hi what, uh, what Hitler said to himself, or uh, this is how it seems to me, you can see it from his very negations, from his policy of drift in the whole autumn of 1938 up into 1939. Something else will happen. The interpretation behind the book was all wrong because he totally failed to take any account of the dynamism of Nazism. I've never managed to think, for instance, of a single subject for a book. I, yes, I'm wrong. I thought of one and it brought ruin and disaster upon me. I alone thought of the origins of the Second World War and I was abused by this for 20 years. So I've been vindicated now. Uh, he insisted on treating uh, Hitler uh, uh, as if he were uh, as he explicitly said, uh, in foreign politics, he was just like any other uh, European statesman, only rather tougher. But, uh, uh, and that is simply untrue, because he uh, was a different kind of person, and this can be uh, demonstrated. From my point of view, his real contribution to history was that he uh, was the first person to put a jemmy into the uh, received notion of how the Second World War started. And I mean, I don't mean September 1939, I mean from 1933 onwards. And Taylor actually did uh, approach this topic in a, in a, with a completely open mind. And he did demonstrate to me that the blame was very widely spread and that there were all sorts of wrong turnings taken. It was never too late, almost like World War I. It was never too late to do it, to have done it differently. I think it was one of the greatest books of the second half of the 20th century. What Origins did was to say, let's not look at Hitler as the progenitor of the Holocaust. Hitler, he says, is not a monster. He is a nap, he's just another German statesman. So therefore, if you look at him as a foreign policy actor, and you look at what he actually does, he's not planning this war. Therefore, what it did was to force people to look at the origins of the war not as a moral issue, but as another piece of, of, one might say, diplomatic history. People didn't like this. That book caused a moral firestorm around Taylor's head in a way that I'm sure he didn't anticipate and would have been, and would have been horrified, actually, had he, had he thought this might have been the case. So it's a book that broke the logjam of history. It's a brilliant book. It forced people actually to think about what they were doing. But at the same time, it probably did appalling things for Taylor's immediate and long-term reputation. But Taylor's reputation among historians had been under attack for years. Nowhere was this more apparent than at Oxford, where Taylor's celebrity and combative style had earned him both the envy and disapproval of his colleagues. Anyone who shows up his colleagues as being mediocre or uh, retarded um, will find that they all unite against him. What they really hated were the opinion columns he had been writing for papers like the Sunday Express since the early 50s. These 800-word tirades, written at breakneck speed, earned him a lot of money. They were parodies of his other writing, opinionated and effortless. Although he would describe them as sideline trifles, Taylor resented any criticism of them. He was proud of his ability to reach huge readerships and, as in his television appearances, to straddle worlds utterly remote from Oxford. They didn't like um, uh, writing for the Daily Express. They didn't like the Observer. That was felt to be very um, not the done thing. I mean, the sorts of things that we kill for to do nowadays uh, were seen as eliminating him from serious contention as a first-rate historian. I have to admit that some of the things which he wrote uh, in the Beaverwood Press were, in my opinion, uh, degrading. 